I think it's good, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you very much for Ursula and Catalina for inviting myself and Derek here to, to talk with you. It's a real pleasure for, to come to Chile, also to South America for the first time and work with, work with um, people at the university and in the, um, the school system that you have in Chile. And I'm really happy here to, uh, to come here today and talk to you about the subject that I'm most interested in, which is the subject of, of design. And in, in particular, the idea of what design is and design can be. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you today about is um, how design is really um, something that um, is fundamental to a lot, of, a lot of the things that we do as societies, as communities, as universities, in education. Um, and it's really the idea of design as, as some uh, process of thinking out about the future that I'm really interested in, some general process. So I'm going to talk about a lot of disciplines that I've been involved with, different design disciplines. And I'm going to try and, and argue that design is something that can really help us think about, um, think about the future in, in general, but also think about the complex problems that face us in the world today, uh, also in our, our, our communities, and particularly in education and how we generate the knowledge that we all need um, to live with. So I'm going to, I have a, I have a, a script to read out if anyone wants to um, um, get a translation of this, I'm sure we could arrange for that uh, 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 later on. But, yeah, um, yeah, sí, vamos a hacer una, una traducción de todo el texto escrito de todo lo que va a hablar y se las podemos enviar a todos después, ¿ya? Pero no queremos que estar haciendo todo el tiempo porque si no, no puede como hablar de esta manera. Okay. Okay. So this is a person called um, Aaron Schwartz, uh, who was born in Boston in 1986. And some of you may have heard of him through a documentary that was made, made about him in 2014 called The Internet's Own Boy. And if you haven't seen it, it's a really great documentary. It's, it's free to view on YouTube, um, and it's, it's really worth watching. Now, the title of the, uh, of the video, The Internet's Own Boy, was really well chosen because what Aaron did through his involvement with a number of influential projects was to show how the democratic and creative potential of the internet could be realized. At age 13, he produced a version of Wikipedia before Wikipedia existed. He helped develop Reddit, one of the first social networking websites in 2005. He helped develop RSS technology, which syndicates regularly published web content. You may, if you sign up for a website, it gives you regular, uh, regular updates without you having to go to that website. <coughs> Things like web content and po podcasts. And he worked on the computational and legal framework for creative commons, <laughs> a form of copyright that means that you or I can easily draw on and reference the creative work of others. So um, if you use Flickr, for example, you can sign a copyright agreement, a creative commons copyright agreement at a, a number of levels. And you can, you can use photos in the work that you do. So some of the work that some of the images that I show in this presentation come from a Creative Commons license. What drove Aaron was a desire to make important information open and freely available so that collectively, as a community, as a society, any one of us could build on the work of others. And that's a, quite a simple aim, you would think. And that, but that simple aim got him into trouble. So many of us that work at universities uh, public, uh, publish in academic journals, and some of us edit academic journals. And you may you may have academic journals in your or your library that you refer to. And I edit a journal, uh, and of course, the research that we do is published in research papers that are then published in academic journals. And to an outsider, if you don't know this system, it's a it's it's a strange model. It's a strange model of how we publish our research in academic papers. So we spend a lot of time producing our articles, our journal papers. We do a lot of research. We apply for 
grant grant monies like the one that we're here for in, in Chile. Uh, we set up experiments. Uh, we have to analyze all our data. We have to collect data. There's a long process of of um, what finding results from our data and then actually trying to publish that uh, data in a paper. So when we actually get to publication in a paper, we we then submit it to a a journal for publication. Um, and when we do submit that uh, our paper for publication, it's judged by our peers. So it's called peer review. That, so that paper gets sent to a number of uh, uh, experts in the area, and they say they read through the paper and they say, "Yeah, this is this is okay. We think this is publishable. Uh, maybe you can change this bit or change that bit." But that's the that's the model that um, that we operate. In, a, in the act, academic journal system. So if we are judged favorably, our paper is accepted, and we release our copyright, so we release our copyright to the publisher. So we say, okay, we sign over, we give this article to the publisher, and then it's their, it's their property. It's not our property anymore. The publisher then sells our paper back to us, usually through our university library. So we have to actually pay money to read our own our, our, the, the work that we've done. So it's, that's what I mean. It's a strange model. If you don't, if you don't know, if you don't know it. You think, well, how does this, how does this work? Then? So basically, the ex the extensive content, and this is really, you know, we're, we're generating new knowledge. It's 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 important um, work that we're doing. The content that we generate for publication is unpaid for by the publisher. They don't pay us for it. We 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 pay them for it. So, and the work of peer reviewing, when it goes to the uh, our, our other experts to judge what our work, which ensures the quality of what we produce, that's unpaid for, too, unpaid for by the publisher. So then we hand over our property to someone else, and then they sell it back to us, and we have to pay for it. It's it's crazy. <laughs> um, but they make a lot of money. Publishers make a lot of money from the academic publishing. You wouldn't maybe not think so. But Elsevier, the publisher that published his journal that I edit, I edit a journal called Design Studies, that made $3 billion of profit in 2014. So they make a lot of money. Um, now, come, come in, coming back to Aaron Schwartz, the problem for Aaron Schwartz was that situating the very latest fundamental knowledge behind a paywall effectively that stops people outside of universities accessing that knowledge it's okay if you're in a university you can go into the library you can download papers you could you can um, pull journals off the shelf you can do these things um, but if you live in India or some other country you can't you can you don't have access to this knowledge and sometimes this knowledge is is vital particularly kind of the latest medical knowledge for example um, so situating that knowledge behind a paywall stops people outside of universities as well as those in developing countries being able to access and learn from and use that knowledge. And Aaron wanted to free knowledge so that anyone, not just academics, could build on the insights of others. And, and um, he started reading academic papers at age 13, age 14, He's, you know, super intelligent guy. Um, and he couldn't get he, he just couldn't get enough knowledge in at that at that age. Um, so in other words, what he wanted to do was to bring public access to the public domain. That's what his his sort of mission was. Now in 2011, Aaron was being tracked by the FBI. He'd already successfully used the power of social networking to challenge and halt the Stop Online Piracy Act going through U.S. Congress that many thought could have really bad consequences for free speech in America. He'd also developed a system of automatically downloading large but inaccessible public document archives. So things like the articles of US legislation, you could, you could pull them off one by one, but it was a really, um, really long process to, 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 to try and do that. So he wanted to bring those into the public domain so that people could have access to them so that it could use that information effectively. And that clearly marked him out as someone the government should keep an eye on. So in January 2011, he found himself in a cleaner's cupboard at MIT, plugged into their computer network, 
and automatically downloading thousands, thousands of academic journal articles for free distribution. He was arrested for state break breaking and entering, which soon escalated to a number of federal indictments and charges carrying 35 years of imprisonment. So, and despite both MIT and the journal publishers later dropping their case against him, he was in the process of being prosecuted when he took his own life, age 26. So this is a story of a powerful intelligence that we've lost. Uh, someone who had the ability to understand the structures and the barriers that control information, that control information flows, and someone who had a moral sense to realize that our progress is through sharing and creativity. And the computational and the coding ability, critically, he was, he was great at coding, uh, to be able to do something about it. So he had this ability to understand what he wanted to do at a high level, at a political level, at a moral level, but he also had this ability to actually create the systems to be able to do that. So in the middle of the film, if you watch the film online, uh, there's a scene here that I, that I thought was quite interesting. And I, this is a still from the film. And you can see on the T-shirt here, there's a little phrase here, uh, which says, Perhaps idealistically, design will save the world. Now what Aaron did, I think, shows many of the characteristics of what we normally think of as designing. Understanding the formal and the informal laws that govern our behaviors, and trying through making new structures and forms to change the world for the better. So I've chosen this example because if we think of what Aaron Schwartz was doing as designing, then there's no identifiable design discipline. There's no product, there's no furniture, there's no building, no vehicle, no clothing, no machine, no printing. He's, he's created his own sort of design discipline. All the things we generally teach as design in our university, so these are all the kind of disciplines of design that we, we teach, architecture, product design, graphic design, interaction design. So the kind, of, the kind of design Aaron Schwartz was doing, the kind that addresses the nature of how we do things in a society that's politically charged, legally challenging, that questions corporate interests, but is democratically configured, this kind of design represents, I think, the problems that the 21st century imagination, and that's your imagination here, uh, needs to be working on. But I started at the end. <laughs> I started at the end of my talk. This is the conclusion that I want to reach. So I'm going to rewind to the, to the beginning, and I'm going to tell you something about where I come from and what I've done over the, over the years. <laughs> so this is a photograph of me in uh, 1968, taken by my, my father. So in the photo, I'm already displaying an unhealthy attachment to the material world. In this case, to advanced German engineering, an Auto Union 1000S coupe with a wraparound windscreen. Back in the late 60s, this was Vorsprung durch Technik, as the Germans say, one, head, one step ahead of technology was their catchphrase for um, Audi. So that interest in the design world has stayed with me. And after studying for an undergraduate degree in electronics, I worked as an engineering system designer and became fascinated in what I and others who call themselves designers actually do, particularly in the type of qualities and abilities that designers have when they solve design problems. So I, I was just interested in what, design, what is design? How do we do this? How do, how do we do this activity? So to try and figure out those, those qualities and abilities, we could start by just looking at the world around us, the objects that we have, the, the situations that we find our, ourselves in. <laughs> Look at the, the objects in the world around us. We could try to figure out how these things might relate to a designer or a design process. 
and attempt to piece together the intentions behind them. What's, what's the intention of doing this or that? And it's particularly tempting to ask, what was, the what was the designer thinking of when things are difficult to use? And we all have those situations where you try and, you try and get something off. Why isn't this coming off? This is, uh, you know, it's, something's difficult. And you sort of think, what was the designer thinking of when they were, when they were trying, to, trying to do this? Or when you're on a website and you sort of, why does this thing keep happening? Um, so, and the world, of course, is filled with, with designed objects, tangible objects, physical objects and intangible objects, virtual, virtual objects. So there's no shortage of things um, to choose from. But here's just one of those um, things uh, that I found in a street market about a year ago. It's an electric desk fan to keep a breeze going. And I think it's really a beautiful thing, this. Uh, it has a really nice contrast in colors, uh, in geometry. Um, it's got a really nice reflection outwardly of the internal structure. So these little things here, they're just, they, they kind of situate nicely with all the other um, circles around. Um, it's got a kind of brawn-like feel to it. Um, these rivets here relate to the internal workings of the, um, the fan. You can see where the batteries, the batteries go, these sort of rivets come here. But they've all been positioned nicely. Uh, and I think it's just a really nicely well designed thing. It's got nice little details here, these little curved corners here in the way the sort of circles relate to each other. This nice little switch at the top, you can imagine your thumb switching that across. Uh, and then sort of funny details here, like, you know, why is this little green thing? Why, why does this line not come right down to the edge there? Um, so it's, it's, it's a nice, really, really nice object. But the thing is, I couldn't, I was interested in who the designer was of this object. And I did a lot of research and I just haven't been able to find out who designed this thing. But by taking it apart and looking at it, I have some idea about how it might have been designed. There's a rational feeling to, to the fan, a sense that the things I, that I've pointed to have been very purposefully thought out and integrated together with form, color, a mechanical and electrical connection it, it all integrates very well into a nicely de nicely designed thing and actually you can even look at the world the whole world as a designed object the Scottish philosopher David Hume writing in the period known as the European Enlightenment in the mid 1700s produced a book called the dialogues of natural religion and this book subtly knocks over what's called the argument from design. The idea that the world and everything in it is such a complicated and seemingly ordered thing that only a designer, and by implication that designer would be God, could have come up with it, which proves God's existence. That's the argument from design. Only a, only a designer could have produced these things. So, so David Hume, um, while not denying that a, de a designer had designed the world. You couldn't really question the existence of God in the 1700s. Um, instead, explores the qualities that, that such a designer had. If you look at the world around you, what, what qualities does the world have and what, can you, uh, what, what inferences can you um, draw from that? And he says, well, this world might just be a poor copy of another world. It might be a... Um, and the designer might be a novice designer. Or as Hume puts it, puts it and I quote him, him here, the first rude essay of an infant deity, which means the first, you know, the first attempt at designing a world. The designer might not be a single designer at all, but a team of designers. And the designer might have long since passed away or died, no longer an all-seeing and all-knowing God. Um, the fact that the design continues to exist doesn't mean that the designer continue, continues to exist. So the designer of this, I don't know whether they're alive or dead. Um, so it, he's questioned you know, the, 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 the nature of God by looking at the, the design world around. So the, so the designer of this electric fan, if it was one designer, may no, may no longer be with us. 
And in any case, there are other things we don't know about the designer. We might be able to guess some of their influences. I know uh, some of the influences, might, there's a kind of German influence here, a Braun kind of influence, but there's Italian language there. So, um, and we might, uh, but things like their nation nationality, their level of education, their level of experience, and, and indeed the practice, the way that they design, means that the original intentions behind, uh, behind this object still remain unknown. So if we start from the world of things, the qualities and abilities of designers begin to take, a slightly, take on a slightly mysterious and reverential air. So there's a, a tendency to, to talk about designers in terms of geniuses. You know, the, this object is just so beautiful, the, the, the designer is a genius. Um, when a design is very successful, we, we tend to attribute that success to someone really being able to think, think something uh, in a kind of genius-like way. And we discount the other key factors that may have contributed, like working with a good client or having an intelligent manufacturer that enables something, something to happen, for example. And most design work is, by definition, normal. It's not this kind of genius side. Most design work is just um, doing jobs, getting briefs in, uh, making things. And so perhaps we should be looking to that if we are interested in the behavior of designers, not, not these uh, super, super designers that are super successful, but the average, the average uh, designer that works um, in industry. So another way of looking at these qualities and abilities is to look at designers in action by studying the process of design. Now, over about 25 years, I've looked at a lot of design processes and in many different disciplines. And what's always struck me as interesting is that so much time is devoted to things that don't yet exist. So all the conversations that you have, all the sketches and the models that you make, all the schematics and the diagrams and visualizations that you do, they're all aimed at nailing down this, this fluid, not yet existing entity at the end, what we call the design, the object or the system. So there's a lot of, uh, uh, just a lot of talk and imagination and things that go into a design, but it's, it's, it's something in the future that doesn't exist. We're, we're creating this future. A colleague of mine called Peter Medway, who sadly died recently, used the term virtual to describe what it is that designers work on. Virtual buildings, virtual desk lamps, virtual computers, virtual pepper grinders, virtual websites. But he didn't mean virtual in the sense of virtual reality, that he, he meant it in the sense of virtual being almost, or not quite. And if you look at a dictionary definition of the word virtual, uh, it says, quote, not such in fact, but capable of being considered, considered as such for some purpose. So it's like it's not, it doesn't quite exist, but you can assume that it might exist in order to do something with it kind of thing. So that's his definition of virtual that I think really sums up the kind of uh, nature of the design process. And actually, talking about things that don't exist might be taken as a sign of madness or, or delusion even. But it turns out there are many ways that we can think and talk about the possible future. And that's what my research has been focused on over the over the years. So it strikes me that designers conduct very specific types of dialogue, hence the title of my talk, um, A Dialogue with the Future. And understanding how these types of dialogue function are critical to understanding what designing is as an activity, and perhaps points the way to what designing could be in the future. I started my research career in a department of psychology at Sheffield University in the, in the UK, in the north of the UK. It's a big city called Sheffield. Uh, and what I tried to do when I first started my PhD is I tried to model design thinking using um, an artificial intelligence program, programming language called Prolog. If you've ever come across Prolog, it's a really difficult language. <laughs> I don't, I don't, uh, don't advise you to use it. 
Um, but basically what I was attempting to produce was what's called a knowledge-based system. So I was trying to understand the knowledge that's involved in, in um, a design process so I could model it on a computer. But I also work with videotape to study designers, to, to study architects, product designers, and engineers. Uh, and, but unlike, and unlike back in, uh, whenever it was, 1992, there wasn't much video of design activity around around then. Now, now you can just go on YouTube and type in design process video and you get thousands of videos of designers doing stuff. But back in the 90s, it was, you had to, you had to get this big bit of kit and set it up and actually go out and film, um, film designers designing. So I asked designers to solve design problems while getting them to think out loud in a procedure known as protocol analysis. So the theory is that thinking aloud, so you basically have to keep talking while you're doing something, it gives, you, gives the researcher access to someone's immediate thoughts through their ability to verbalize the contents of their short-term memory. So the theory is that you can, you have a short-term memory, You've, you can remember things for the short term just in helping you engage with the world, have conversations and things, um, and you can actually know what's in your short-term memory and verbalize it. And that means we can follow a person's focus of attention and work out what information they're processing. So that it's a kind of research method that allows access to people's thoughts so we can work out what, what it is they're focused on and work out the process of what, what they're actually doing. So this is a sequence from an early study I did where I asked a number of architects to design a primary school on an existing site. And you can sort of see how the, the design progresses. This is an architect um, filling out the different spaces, looking at the different activities, and then generating a number of alternatives for the um, primary school, where it, where it will sit on the site. Um, the, uh, the access to the, to the building is important, um, both for cars and for um, children. And as we go through this process, you can see how the details begin to emerge. The early um, spatial kind of work begins to feed back into the, um, the, the, the design and the layout of the school. It all becomes a lot clearer. The tower here at the bottom. Uh, and this is the, the final um, solution that this architect <coughs> Over the course of an, an hour, that just took an hour basically to, to design this primary school. You can see all the, uh, the different areas of the school are quite well defined. Um, there's a, a, a side view of the, how the site changes. Um, so it was a pretty well worked out um, design process. And all the, all the time she was doing this, she was verbalizing the contents of what she was saying. So that was the nature of the experiment, that she was both drawing and then would, would talk um, about what she was doing. And my, my task as a researcher was to analyze that, that thought process. And what, what you get in an experiment using this method, protocol analysis, is pretty confusing information. So participants aren't meant to try and make sense of what they're say, saying, they're just meant to say it without thinking. So it's just talk, 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 all the time just talk. And from these verbal accounts, it's possible to identify the different cognitive mechanisms and strategies that designers use in solving problems. For example, you can tell whether they're thinking about the problem in some way or thinking about the solution. And I found in my research that engineers, engineers tend to think a lot more about problems, while architects think in much, much more in terms of solutions. So they, they naturally try and translate previous solutions into new, into new problem uh, problems that they get, whereas engineers are very much, uh, what's, what's this problem and what are all the other problems associated? They don't tend to think in terms of prior, past solutions. Though the very nature of design is that these problems and solutions are connected in what's termed a wicked, wicked way. And wicked, wicked means that once you propose a solution to a problem, you start to develop a different idea of what the problem is. So. In, in thinking about a solution, you start thinking about the problem in a different way. So the problem and the solution are sort of connected, and there's a sort of dialogue between the two, the two bits of designing. 
Uh, and quite often, um, one, of the, one of the famous phrases in design is that a designer works towards the problem of the problem. So you have this kind of superficial problem um, that a client will come to you with a brief. And what one of your tasks as a designer is to actually question that problem. Is that the real problem that you're, you want solving? Do you really want this bit of graphic design that I've asked you to do? Or, or do you want some kind of something else? Do you want a whole interaction design system? Or, or, or do, you want, do you want a building instead of a graphic design? You know, it's actually to question that and working out what the real problem of the problem is, the core, the core issue that needs solving. But there are limitations with this method of trying to verbalize thought. So as you saw in that, that, that sequence, the design process isn't, isn't just a verbal process, it's a visual, visual process too, that all the drawings that are produced. And it doesn't take long to realize that the verbal and the visual work together. And also, one of the things that I realized was it's pretty, pretty much impossible to model that process on a computer. So at some stage during my research, I gave up trying to, to Use, use an artificial intelligence programming language to produce a computer model of design activity. Um, this, was a, this is a graph from another study I did, uh, this time with an industrial designer designing a bicycle accessory. So the method of asking designers to think out loud means that you have to continually remind them to keep doing it, so that as an experimenter you keep having to sort of say, you know, prompt them to think out loud. And this graph illustrates what happens when you do. So this line, the line shows how the verbal, the verbal rate, so on the left is the, the rate of talking. So I'm probably talking about 100 words, 100 words a minute. Uh, how it slows down uh, as, as um, Dan, Dan, who's the subject, the industrial designer, prepares to, prepares to draw. So it decreases almost to to zero as, as the designer starts to draw. So what this shows is, is that the visual has taken over the short-term memory. Something else is, is in the short-term memory. It's not the kind of words. Um, so he's lost his ability to kind of verbalize, or he's forgotten. It, it, it's forgotten that he has to verbalize. So his short-term memory has forgotten that it has to do something. Um, so, the, so Dan, as a designer, has gone into a different way of thinking, you might imagine. Um, so when prompted to think out aloud here, again, so the experimenter at this point says, you know, can you, can you keep talking? He basically stops drawing um, and starts to, starts to talk again. So that there's a kind of interference in the process there. So the, the method of trying to access the thing that we're interested in, verbalization, protocol analysis and verbalization, it's interfering with the process that we are trying to access, the design process. That's because design is much more than a task of short-term memory. Um, classically, protocol and that has, analysis has been used, to, um, used as a method to look at things like problem solving. If you want to solve a crossword, for example, you want to solve a puzzle. It's very good at doing that because it's a very sort of short-term task. You've got the You've got everything on the table in front of you. You need to move things around, and you can you can verbalise that very easily. But design is much much more of a process that involves the long term memory. It's a process that draws heavily on experience, memories, and patterns buried in deep in long term memory. And as beginning designers, you may be beginning to lay down those patterns now, beginning to see the find the people your influences uh, that that have been. A good influences and um, begin to get a sense of the problems that you're you're interested in working on. And we could even say that some of the some of the things in long term memory are, are unconscious or even um, things that we, we we just can't say at all. They just kind of emerge at some point. A memory is a kind of an emotional thing too. So you have kind of emotional connections, and that's very difficult to access through a method like protocol analysis, which is very objective. So, the design process is also a process where thought is actually externalized. In the primary school example, the sketching provides a way for the designer to converse with herself. So by, by sketching on a, uh, uh, on a piece of paper, she can project, project and then kind of reinterpret that. 
The sketching provides a way for the, the designer to converse with herself, to project outwards in order to project back, back inwards again. The sketches help her to learn about a possible future and to develop a more accurate way of dealing with it with and shaping shaping that future. So as a as an architect, she can say, well the door could be here. Oh no wait, let's put let's put the door over here and let's see what that, that would mean. <coughs> so you can move a door around in two seconds. You can say the door's here or the door's there. And it's a, because it's a virtual building, you can play with the idea of the door being here or a door being there. Would that increase the flow of people in this in this uh, this part of the building? What happens if we put a door over there? So it's a real, you know, it's a quick, a quick, a quick way of, of of seeing what the future might be in a in a sketch. And these are the kinds of questions that a designer seeks to answer by externalizing their thoughts into sketches, diagrams, models, prototypes, and computer visualizations. The educationalist Donald Schoen describes it as having a reflective conversation with the materials of the situation. So there's a kind of conversation going on with this thing that you're creating. Uh, not necessarily in here, it's a sort of an external conversation. So what designers do with the words they speak is to try and make sense of them. To use them in their process of design as things to think with. So with a research method of protocol analysis, what starts out as a simple method of verbalization, so we're simply asking people to um, think out loud, it turns into another version of the design process. So once you say a word, and it's a sort of meaningful word, then you think, hang on a minute, that's an interesting word. Maybe I can use that in something. So it becomes part of the process. You're actually uh, trying, trying to verbalize. So it's an ex words, words become the external projections that then allows you to kind of reflect inwardly. So this is a, a, a dia what I've characterized this is a dialogue with self that goes on. Uh, so when you project things externally, and those things might be sketches, but they also might be words that you're speaking that then become uh, things that you can work with, uh, things that you can think about and then project again. So this kind of cycle of um, projection and interpretation that goes on. This idea of projection becomes much clearer when you step out of the laboratory so you stop filming people in and contriving situations and into the commercial world of design. If you walk into a design office and sit in design meetings, as I did for a number of years, or even just quietly observe what's happening in a design process, you experience lots of talking, lots of conversation, lots of pointing at things, lots of showing, lots of describing, uh, lots of collaboration people going up and talking to each other and trying to work out what the problems are. The models and representations and the sketches and the schemes are still there, but they're overlaid with a talk that ex explores their integrity, their meaning, their look, their look and feel, the way they work. You know, so the, the conversation is about, is, is this the right thing? Do we need something else? Do we, is this working? Is, uh, what, what is that little feature of the design? So. There's a tendency to think that the design process is just a visual process of producing things, but you forget that all the, time, all the while we're talking and those words have meaning. So these arrangements and details matter. And at the heart of any design process is the choice between alternatives, the generation and the weighing up of problems and solutions. So is it better like this or is it like that? Should the door be here or should the door be there? or maybe a combination of both. So it's also a process where there is inherent uncertainty, while the implications of various alternatives are worked through. So you have a number of, you saw the, in the architectural example, a number of different alternatives. And you know at that point, the architect is uncertain about which, which alternative uh, is the best alternative. So designers have to be comfortable with that uncertainty. There's a famous uh, English, poet called John Keats, who calls this ability, who calls this negative capability, the phrase that he uses, which is basically being comfortable with things being uncertain. And his quote is, is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. So it's just be, being comfortable with, with, with things being unresolved somehow. That's what, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
it's a feature of a of a designer of, of a de de an ability of a designer. So designing is speculative. It's about the future, but it's also much more of a social activity than a cognitive activity. A process of getting agreement between different parties and disciplines. People come to a design process with different sets of professional ex expertise and experience. So you have architects, project managers, structural engineers, product designers, interaction designers, manufacturers, coders. They all come with a, a different language. They all bring a language with them for talking about um, design processes. Larry Bucciarelli, a colleague of mine from MIT, refers to these languages as object worlds, where an individual's disciplinary experience has the appearance of being objective. So to an engineer, they're describing the world objectively. Um, though in a design process that, that involves other disciplines, there are many different versions of what, what's objective. So if, if a structural engineer is working with an architect, the architect has this sort of language of what's objective, and the structural engineer has a, has a different language. At some point, those two things have to meet. You have to kind of resolve misunderstandings. And that's what demands negotiation and a, an agreement. So a new world around the problem and solution has to be constructed. And that's usually first, first formed in discussion and in language. As before, words become verbal sketches, outward projections to think with, though this time in a social context. So it's a, di a, a di dialogue with others rather than a dialogue with yourself that develops. Um, this is quite a technical um, example, but you probably get some kind of sense of this in the conversation that I've shown here. And this was from a study I did uh, some years ago where I basically sat in a corner of, a, of an engineering design company for a, quite a few weeks and we developed, I can't remember how many words, but we had hundreds hundreds of uh, tra transcriptions of conversation, so you can sort of see the conversation down here. This was just from taking notes of, of people conversing in, in um, the office. And this particular segment um, is from a meeting that was called to discuss, so there's an engineering company, they were, um, they work with the motor industry in the, mid in the Midlands in, uh, in the UK. And this was a meeting called to discuss problems in the design of a rolling road. And a rolling, a rolling road, I don't know if you have the term over here, do you have that? Rolling, rolling road, it's, it's uh, something that's used to test a car's performance. So you, so you drive a car onto a rolling road yeah. mm -hmm. and it sort of spins the wheels. Uh, and, um, and, and you can work out how a car's performing. So it's the same. So it's the same kind of uh, thing that uh, the, the recent case of Volkswagen and their their device, where that was that was discovered by putting a car on a rolling road and. and um, so I mean, and that's the, the Volkswagen case is a there's a illustration of how design decisions. Are ethical in nature. I mean that that just, that decision that was an, an intentional um, device that was created to defeat the emission tests mm -hmm. really created a, a a massive global problem that you know has has had an effect on people's health and um, possibly people's lives. But I'll come back to that later. Um, and I, I won't read the exchange in detail, but. There's a lot of a lot of features of, of conversation like this. Um, there's a kind of an account given of a problem at the beginning. You know, there's a problem. There's a problem with this rolling road that they're trying to design. Uh, things aren't quite working, um, and the discussion takes place exploring the possible solutions to that problem. So there are technical principles involved. There's a perception of what the client will think. Um, And later on in the discussion, they start talking about aesthetics, the way that the, the, the rolling road comes up and how that comes up and whether the back com coming up before the front is, is, looks, looks better or is, is acceptable to the client. All these little kind of things related to a very kind of average engineering design uh, problem. So in other words, this is the type of conversation that you get 
every day in all types of design organizations up, up and down the country in the UK and I'm sure in Chile and uh, America everywhere it's, you know, this is the kind of typical design conversation so this is the normal design that I referred to earlier it's not it's we, we haven't got a room full of design geniuses sort of producing the, the, the best rolling road that's ever been produced it's just a, a, a you know a kind of normal design process so in the agreements that are made the language develops relating the form of the emergent thing to the thoughts and discussion that goes into furthering that form. The problem you see here is later collapsed into a single phrase. So this, this, this discussion later, later becomes a single phrase which is called balancing the lift edge. So in future discussions they, they, they refer back to this discussion um, and that acts as a kind of shorthand in referencing the discussion in later conversations. So the, you, you have a big discussion and then you start, the way you refer to that is by sort of a, a smaller phrase so that that's the development of a la the language through the design process and these words and phrases they're constructed as the, the virtual thing itself is constructed so as you as you construct your design you construct a language around that design that relates to the design and that's what appears everywhere in design discourse that, that's what you begin to see you're trying to work out uh, the meaning of uh, what what meaning is attached to certain words in design processes This is another example that comes from a more recent project that I did um, together with someone called Janet McDonnell from the University of the Arts in London. And this project followed the design process of a, of a new crematorium in Milton Keynes. Crematorium where you, where, where you, <laughs> you know what a crematorium is. Um, and uh, the problem is Milton Keynes is a, is a city, it's a fast growing city just north of London and as you get more people in the city, you, you have to, you get more people dying in the city and you have to create um, places where you can deal with that. <laughs> um, so the research took place over a number of years. The building is now finished and operational, so we, we had a tour of the building. Um, but we track the design process from the very first discussions between architects, the architect and client. And this is one of the early visualizations of the crematorium. And this area that I've circled here um, had a lot of discussion. Uh, it's the, the waiting area where people come in. So the car parks over here, and this is the first place where you go into while you wait to go into the rest of the um, service, the waiting area. And you think waiting, a waiting area is a fairly simple space. You know, you just go in, you sit on a seat, you wait to be called off. Um, but what was interesting was that there was a lot of conversation about the waiting area. Waiting in a, it's not as straightforward as it sounds. So the waiting area in a place like a crematorium is an emotionally charged space. Um, it's a reflective space. You want people, you know, something serious has happened. Um, but sometimes it's a more routine space. You've got taxis coming, they pick up people. They, uh, when, there's, when there aren't services going on, um, it's kind of people coming in and out. And then at occasions you get these emotionally charged um, meetings of people, particularly when, when different bits of a family don't like each other and they come in and sometimes there's, there, there are fights, there are arguments, uh, some people want to go outside, they want to smoke, um, and sometimes even like a, a formal segregation is required. So there's, it becomes a quite a complicated um, activity in a crematorium waiting. So it can be sure. The waiting time, though often short, can be variable. So in, in the discussion right early in the design process, um, there was a kind of 10 minutes where the idea of waiting was, was discussed. And it just took on, it expanded and took on a whole load of dimensions, meanings, and associations. First, it was a small space, a bit larger, before finally being decreased in size again. It's first a simple space, then a more complex arrangement with an external waiting space added for a time. And again, the, the word waiting is loaded with meaning and association as the design process progresses, carrying the ideas for the waiting space that have been discussed. So in subsequent meetings, waiting, it, was, it had all these meanings associated with it because of the, the first discussion about, about waiting. So the concept of waiting in this particular context is constructed 
and reflect and refined as solutions are explored and the problem develops. So as we saw before in the dialogue with self, the words and language are not they're not they're not extraneous to the design process. Extraneous means they're not just a, a kind of um, waste material in the design in, de, in the design process. The words are kind of critical to the design process. They they constitute the design process in some way. They function to explain, to describe, to evaluate, to tell stories, to articulate and capture experience. And they not only refer to and relate to solution forms, they are themselves solution forms. So a word can really be suggestive of, of a particular solution form. So you can think of words as kind of solutions as well, I think. Um, so this is a, a nice quote that I, that I quite like that, that takes all these kind of concepts and put them together. So the quote is, architects assume, and it's about architecture, architects assume that all the associations and meanings and metaphorical connections get communicated through the drawings and then through the built structure. But that's not necessarily the case, which is why many buildings don't have the effect that was intended. So I'm just, and he says, I'm just struck by the narrowness of the funnel that this whole thing has to get through before it goes out into the world. So there's this, in a design process, you have this huge mass of, of, of words and associations, and then you get this kind of narrow funnel that you have to push out this set of drawings and then this kind of built thing and it's a very it's a very final um, manifestation of this huge exploration process so he says what leaves the office the design office is so stripped down and so tenuous uh, compared with the huge huge great mass of associations and metaphors and his phrase is it's like do not inflate your life jacket before you leave the aircraft so you know you can't get out you can't get out of the aircraft if you've got an inflated life jacket or a lifeboat or thing. You have to kind of decompress it all. You have to know how big it's going to be and then decompress it all and then it goes out into the, out into the world. I, I really like that idea that there's all these sort of um, things that have to be um, compressed down into something. So what that quotation describes, although about architectural design, it could be about the design process in any design discipline. And it could equally apply to other disciplines where things get done through the production of things. Disciplines where plans get made, texts get produced, menus get written, music gets played, experiments get conducted. There's plenty of design activity that takes place without an official design designer being present. So I, I write a, a blog and um, what I do in this blog is I try to record some of this designing outside of recognized design, design disciplines, a bit like the designing that Aaron Schwartz, that I said uh, characterized Aaron Schwartz is doing. Um, so one of my blog posts was about Aaron Schwartz, um, but there are other diverse examples. Um, this is Bitcoin, for those of you that um, don't know about it. Um, Satoshi Nakamoto is the person who created Bitcoin. Now, this is a currency that doesn't need a bank or a government to certify and guarantee its value, which is, a, which is an amazing idea when you think about it. It doesn't need a central bank to determine its value. Basically, it, 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 you just need the Bitcoin. Uh, and N Nakamoto uh, is a specialist mathematician. A cryptographer, so the person that created Bitcoin is a cryptographer or someone who makes and cracks codes. And Bitcoin itself is essentially a cryptographic algorithm that generates a chain of numbers. Very special numbers like prime numbers, if you know about prime numbers. But numbers, but just numbers. And each individual Bitcoin is mined by a computer, much like the search for ever higher prime numbers. So as, as you get higher and you're looking for bigger, larger and larger prime numbers, it takes more and more computing power to find the next um, prime number. So in an echo of the David Hume example about um, trying to work out the qualities of, of the designer, um, the identity of Satoshi Nakamoto, if indeed it is one person, remains a mystery. But actually today, uh, on the news, I saw that the, uh, the, the, the creator of Bitcoin has finally said 
it's me, some Hi. Australian guy. So that's uh, yeah. But as I wrote this, I didn't know who this. It, it was a big mystery, and it'd been going on for for a long, long time. So one of the few remarks that she or he or them, it could have been a team of people, I'm sure it was a team of people, about producing the Bitcoin currency, however, was that, quote, much more work was designing rather than coding. I thought that was an interesting remark from a, from a mathematician. And you can sort of see that there are a whole host of aspects to payment transactions than just coming up with a basic cryptographic code. There's the facility to quickly verify authenticity, so you need to know that you've actually got, got the right Bitcoin. Making the code hack-proof, obviously, uh, is gonna be the, the target of um, hackers. As well as, as well as keep it simple and easy to use, payment is one of those things that needs to work 100% of the time, and you need to know that what you've got in your hand is kind of a, a valuable thing. So these are just some of the aspects that need to be designed into the currency. So it has to be a kind of user-centered, in other words. So there's a kind of design process that goes on there. Uh, so this is a completely different example. Um, comes from football. Uh, and again, this was another quote that, that I came across. A recent quote from the Arsenal manager, Arsene Wenger. That's also, Alexis Sanchez is a Chilean player. He yeah, <laughs> plays for Arsenal. Um, this is Mesut Ozil. And, and Arsene Wenger, the manager of Arsenal, uh, made a quote and said, uh, this, was, this is how he was quoted in the newspaper. Wenger thinks the player he bought for a club record of 42.5 million pounds from Real Madrid two summers ago is readier than he has ever been to excel, to design the game consistently and decisively. So this is a, you know, the designer of the game that he's talking about here, this, this creative midfielder. I thought, well, how do you design a game of football when you're playing it? But then I thought, well, I'd suggest there's a kind of trial and error involved. There's a, obviously a collaboration involved. Um, there's an imaginative engagement with, with yourself in terms of how you're thinking about the game, but also with others. And there's a kind of conversation with the materials of the situation, the ball, the players, the, the, the pitch. So I think there's a kind of designing going on there that I think is quite interesting. So the two... These two aspects of the design process that I've described, the, the dialogue with self and the dialogue with others, also serve to underline that these are, to a greater or lesser extent, aspects of everyone's behavior when we try to think about things in the future. There's a sort of, there's a process of working out things in your, your own head, but then actually getting them out into the world and then having conversations about them with other, other people. So what I'm suggesting is that much of our activity both in our professional lives and our personal lives, could be considered as designing. And a friend of, and colleague of mine, Nigel Cross, um, has coined the term designerly in arguing for designing as a distinct form of intelligence. So it's not just uh, um, sort of analytical intelligence or emotional intelligence. There's a, there's a form of intelligence called design that's designerly, that, that's, that's basically you can... Um, think about things in designerly ways. So, that, and that, that ability is pre present to some extent in us all. Um, and it's a way of dealing with the world by changing it, thinking about problems by proposing new solutions. So how do we build on this insight? Why do we need to teach people how to design if they already have the ability to do so? The answer is partly a technical one, the languages or object worlds represented by discipl disciplinary knowledge do form a necessary part of professional design processes, but they're not sufficient in my view, particularly as non-designers, clients and users, for example, generally play important roles in any design process. And having these people with a greater understanding of what designing is, particularly in being comfortable in that space of uncertainty, that negative capability, that any design process opens up, that allows a much richer, more productive, more meaningful dialogue to take place. The more people that understand what they do is kind of design activity, I think that really makes uh, conversations with professional designers much, much, much easier and much more productive. So partly the answer is also about the development of any intelligence. If, if you spend time working at it, 
and you get better at it. But that, that doesn't mean that everyone ends up being a professional designer, but it does mean that the general understanding and appreciation for design increases. So with this idea in mind, while I was at, uh, worked at the Open University, where Derek is now, I, we used to work together, um, before I moved to Brighton University, I led a large team of academics and developers in putting together an online course in design thinking. So this picture shows the creative welcome pack that students received through the post at the beginning of their course. But that was the only thing that they did receive, because the rest of the course was uh, online. And the idea behind the course was to teach the methods of design and designing in a contextual, in a contextual way. A way where people could frame and solve design problems within the confines of their daily lives. At work, at play, or at home. And the thing about the UK, I do, do you have an open university here? No. Some countries have their own version of the open university, which is a sort of distance <laughs> learning university. So, um, And most students at the UK Open University study part-time, so they're, they're working, in, um, working in jobs, and they study in the evenings and at the weekends. Um, so since, and, and Derek tomorrow is going to talk more about this, this particular course. He's been he heavily involved with it, and I think you'll be hearing more about it. So since 2010, when the course launched, a huge diversity of more than 3,000 people have completed the course and from all types of, um, all walks of life. So we've had teachers, we've had librarians, we've had health workers, people in business, military, people in the military, um, people in prison, um, even a Scottish shepherd <laughs> that Derek, uh, that, that Derek tutored, have developed their skills of thinking like a designer. So this is a kind of design education where people learn to build on the work of others through online connections, using the creative power of a network as its educational engine. And Derek will talk a bit more about that tomorrow. But there are also well-known designers that have pr proposed curriculum for teaching design. In 1957, the American Design Partnership of Charles and Ray Eames were asked by the then Indian Prime Minister Nehru to look at how the poor quality of Indian consumer goods could be improved. And they came up with this, um, written in April 1958 by Charles and Ray Eames, um, the India Report. Proposals for an institute and curriculum for design education, and shown here in the picture, at just 15 pages, so it's quite a, it's, it's quite a small document. Mm -hmm. Um, so only 15 pages long and they spent, I think, I think they spent about a year traveling around India and talking to people. Um, and the expectation was that they would produce a big document of, you know, this is what the future of design education in India would, would be. So when they presented this very small thing, uh, I think the Indian government were fairly outraged that they were, they, they, they'd commissioned this big thing and they got this little small thing. But actually, you can, you can get this online too, you can download this online. And in the way that it lays out the ideas about students, about staff, about projects, about methods, about spaces and buildings, um, and impact, it's a model of, of how to present something in a really clear, really economical way. Uh, and a really big thing too, design education, in, you know, population in, of India is, is huge, potentially the influence of this is huge. So in, a, in its sort of sparseness is a kind of beauty, and in the beauty of, is its longevity. This is, you know, how many other things do you know of from 1958 that are still being read as, as current documents? So the report and its recommendations remain right up to date, and not just for India. So this is one of their introductory remarks, and this is, remember, this is 1958. Quote, the change India is undergoing is a change in kind, not a change of degree. The medium that is producing this change is communication, not some influence of the West and East. And the phenomenon of communication is something that affects a world, not a country. 
this was 1958. So that phrase, I think, could equally apply to modern day America in the age of the internet. And I was interested to find that some universities, some universities are rethinking not just how we educate designers, but how we redesign the university. And Catalina knows about this university. This is, this is a book that came out last year. And it describes the design process by which Arizona State University uh, has grown into America's largest public university while increasing um, inclusivity. So while increasing the student numbers but appealing to a, a wider social group of students. It's a public university so it's available to all. And while doing that, while becoming a bigger university and attracting more students from more, a wider range of backgrounds, it's moved into the top tier of American research universities. And that's, that's a, a pretty difficult thing to do. So the authors of this, this book, one of whom is the president of the university, addressed a simple problem. In a higher education market where the top research institutions are highly selective, in who is allowed to study with them. If you think of Oxford or Cambridge or Harvard or Stanford or MIT, they're, they're super selective in who they allow to study with them. You have to be top grade students to get into these institutions. Um, so they asked, well, how is it possible to extensively widen access to higher education to, to attract more people from a wider range of backgrounds, but also, critically, to improve research quality? Normally, if you're trying to uh, increase the range of students. The, the res that's at the expense of research, so you tend to concentrate on teaching uh, and how to how to do teaching and not, not the research. Well, they wanted to do both. So in other words, how do you expose people from more disadvantaged backgrounds, perhaps people who haven't had the chance to develop as, as they might have, for example, how do you expose them to leading research ideas, uh, to new knowledge effectively? And that's a similar problem that Aaron Schwartz was, was uh, working on. How, how, do you, how do you get knowledge to people that need it and that don't have access to it? So he had one solution to this, Aaron Schwartz, to try and shepherd that research or to try and get that research from, from these highly selective in institutions, from places like MIT, where he was finally caught, into the public domain. But Arizona State have designed another under the banner of one university in many places. I think, do you recognize that there? Um, including online places too, so there's a kind of mix of, of teaching uh, methods. And a, and a trebling of funding for interdisciplinary research too, uh, addressing the grand challenges. So framing your kind of research in, in a slightly different way and, and then providing funding, funding for that. And it's been very successful. I mean, the, the results speak for themselves. I think there are 70,000 students mm -hmm. that study there now. And, you know, uh, they've moved into, as I said, the top tier of American research universities. So I think it's really worth looking at. And the book really describes the design process that they went through to do that. It was a very conscious, you know, we're using the methods of design to think about how we design the future of the, of the university. So the internet, I think, has changed the way we do many things, for good and for ill. But, but most of all, it's put us into a new relationship to knowledge and provided new, way, new ways in which we can access and, cru and crucially design access to that knowledge. So the things that we know are increasingly outside of our heads. We, know le we seem to know less and less. And as a young designer, if you want to know something, where do you go? To Google, first of all, to, to, the, to the websites that you know. You, 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 your access to knowledge is, is, can be very quick, but it's also out there. Um, so Google is now the kind of new version of long-term memory, mm -hmm. the kind of collective unconscious for us, us all, where, where we want to go. When, when we want to get inspired, we don't go and offer a walk in the woods now. We go and surf around the internet and uh, see if we can find something that triggers off um, uh, design process. So we're better informed than we've ever been, but that has somehow made the problems of our time and the solution to those problems, if you think of Syria and the Middle East, for example, more elusive than ever. And we continue to think in, in terms of disciplines, particularly in universities, we, t we think in terms of disciplines. Um, this is a picture from a Scottish university called St Andrews, 
again, a highly selective uh, university. And um, on the left, so this is the, um, on the left is the, the entrance to the Department of Moral Philosophy. And on the right, on, on the entrance, on this side is the entrance to the Department of Logic and Metaphysics. <laughs> um, and these are both uh, these are both branches of philosophy. There are two branches of philosophy. And all those years, this is a very old university. Uh, staff and students have been making one choice or another: do I go for moral philosophy or do I go for logic and metaphysics? And you, you can see there's a little. Uh, this is a sort of smoking place over here, so I think moral <laughs> philosophy is a sort of thing you're So, yeah, they've had to make one choice or other. Do you go for morality on the one hand or logic on the other? And this, but, you know, it's, a, it's a, a humorous example. Basically, the choice is reinforced by the architecture. And, you know, there's one door over here and there's one door over there. And you can't move those doors anymore because, you know, like you can in the design process because they're fixed. Um, so it seems to me that our problems, the, the problems that we have, don't really understand these disciplines that we, that, that, that we um, design in. The problems of climate change, of gender inequality, of global finance, and education, to name a few, have a complex dynamic of their own. And the internet, and particularly creative, something like Creative Commons, has pointed the way to some of these solutions, I think. The organization and website TED, which stands for Technology, Entertainment, and Design, design is the D in TED, has given us a broader idea of how design can cut across, it can cut, traverse and sort of connect disciplines that you don't normally associate with design, that frames design in a much broader way, I think. And the open source movement, where anyone can contribute to a large, larger project like Wikipedia or WikiHouse or WikiCar, they've given us new models for how we can work collaboratively and, and, and productively, and where outcomes are continually evolving and continually relevant. But we don't just need to be developing solutions. We need to be framing and working on the right problems, I think. And the trickiest, most important problems always involve established interests in, in, in political interests, legal interests, corporate interests, social interests, and also technical interests. And framing those tricky problems requires imagination. And that is perhaps one of the most effective aspects of design thinking, to help us see problems outside of traditional disciplines and categories, and to propose new forms, new shapes, new structures, new transitions with which we can address them. So in 2007, sorry, um, we have something called the Design Council in the UK, which sort of um, connects design with various um, businesses. In 2007, the UK Design Council awarded Designer of the Year to someone called Hilary Cotton. <coughs> and the, her, her award sparked a, a big, de big debate in the design industries because she wasn't a conventional discipline-based designer. She works on tricky, really tricky public service projects addressing prison, for, prison reform, urban poverty, loneliness, and unemployment. So big, you know, kind of social problems. But she does this by drawing in traditional design expertise when it's needed, using it alongside other types of knowledge, um, particularly the knowledge of those who might contribute or be affected by the by the design she works on. So bringing out the knowledge of the, of the, the, the people that experience these, these problems of, of, of um, loneliness, of old age, of disability, um, using their knowledge and then connecting that knowledge with um, discipline-based based knowledge. But she's sort of designing at a sort of slightly larger level. So the shape of her solutions uh, are more about so social arrangements than physical form putting people in new relationships to one another and strengthening good connections. So I interviewed her for a research project a few years ago uh, and she was given her Designer of the Year Award by the famous German designer Dieter Rams, who, who designed for Braun. And, you know, a huge influence on, on, on modern design. Um, 
and not least by being the inspiration for the head of design at Apple, Jonathan Ive. He, he references um, Dieter Rams as being you know, hugely influential. And when Dieter Rams gave um, Hilary Cotton her award, she said, he told her, this is really, really exciting because the best chair and the best shelf, they've been built now. So let's use these skills for shaping society, which I thought was an interesting uh, comment from someone who's been so involved with developing projects. So design really affects us pretty much every minute of every day. In all, the kinds of, in all kinds of things, in traffic flows, in ticket machines, in computers and in cars, and electric fans and electricity bills, and mobile phones and mobile homes. Um, it's all designed. These things regulate and mediate our behaviors, and they nudge us one way or another to this door or that door. Which door do we go in? Um, the process of design has consequences for us. And mostly these are well-intentioned consequences, but this direct effect on our behavior, along with the fact that unintended consequences often arise, means that designing can also be stood as an ethical activity. So quite often when things go wrong, you know, things happen and you, you realize that actually design's not just a, you're not just creating new things, you're actually affecting people's lives. And that can, and mostly that's in a good way, but sometimes when things don't work out quite how you, think they, they, they do, it can, it, can, it, it can affect people's lives in a bad way and that makes it a sort of an ethical um, activity. So some of you might have heard of a philosopher called Mark Johnson. He uh, wrote a very influential book together with his co-author George Lakoff called Metaphors We Live By. Uh, it's a careful and convincing analysis of how our language, again we're back to the idea of language, draws on root metaphors. The way we describe an argument in terms of, I don't know if you have this in, in Chile, but it, uh, an argument in terms of war. So when you argue with something, there's a kind of war, there's a kind of confrontational sort of metaphor that we use about argument. A conflict sort of metaphor. Or the way we couch the idea of understanding in terms of seeing. So it's a kind of visual metaphor where you have, where you see something you understand. So, uh, and they do this very convincing analysis of how these metaphors are kind of deeply rooted in our language so to the extent we don't even realize that we're, we're using these things. And these metaphors carry with them basic values and associations. And one doesn't have to look at the design process for long to realize that metaphors play a huge part. They, they really help to inflate that life jacket in the earlier um, um, quotation. You know, you start thinking of one thing as another thing and that takes you to somewhere else and that you start thinking of that as another thing and, and pretty, you develop this big, this big thing. Indeed, the basic functioning of a metaphor, the way that one thing can be thought of as another, often appears to be the driving creative force be, be behind the, the, the design process. So a later work by Mark Johnson focuses on the idea of moral imagination. And towards the end, he describes how such a faculty like this can be developed. I think, and that's an interesting, it's an in interesting phrase, that moral imagination, how, you, how, because you tend to think of moral morality as being analytical, you know, you look at something, you describe a situation, you think, is that right or is it wrong? You don't tend to think of it as being creative. Moral imagination, towards the end, he describes how, how, how this ability of mor um, can be developed. And to quote him, he says, we must cultivate moral, moral imagination by sharpening our powers of discrimination exercising our capacity for envisioning new possibilities and imaginatively tracing out the implications of our metaphors, prototypes and narratives. Now all those sort of things, those possibilities, metaphors, prototypes, narratives, that sounds to me like design thinking, design thinking. And that link between design and ethics in terms of a thinking process underlines the importance and potential of design, both as a valuable activity in itself to develop our thinking about possible futures. And that's something that will save the world, as Aaron's t-shirt uh, had on it. So this is very much design outside of traditional disciplines that I've been talking about, a sort of creative and essential element to every discipline. And I think it's a way of kind of opening up our future. That's what I think design thinking is about, not closing it down into, the, into these sort of uh, areas that that we feel that we're not qualified to, um, to explore.
So that's my talk. Thank you very much for listening. the um, our design yeah and our topic is alert design alert design alert, alert. alert. so Designing. the topic of the of the video will be uh, how to be prepared or how to use design in emergencies okay how design is capable of dealing with yes. emergencies yeah right uh, yeah so I think it relates a lot uh, with what you did talking about. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Especially in how can we, as we are in Chile, we all know, we have lots of emergencies. And we've had many problems related with emergencies, and many people have died mm. through that problem. For example, in the tsunami of 2010, and there was a communication problem between the government mm -hmm. and the um, security entities and many people didn't know that a tsunami was coming in for example in uh, like Agua Fernandez and so the big wave came and took everything and nobody could, could even get out of their house because they didn't know because there was a problem of communication so how relevant do you think that something is too, yeah. Yeah, no, I think it's really relevant. I mean, when you see the, the number of crises and, you know, not just natural disasters, but man-made man disasters, and, and how to, res you know, the response to those needs to be quicker. And I, I mentioned that something like the, um, the open source house. There's a, there's a, you can Google it, you can watch the video. I think that's very much intended to develop um, ways of building um, or kind of mechanisms of building very quickly for it, for disaster relief I think that's one way of, of taking of taking that sort of, of thing so you're actually you're, you're beginning to put architectural expertise in the hands of people that aren't architects so they you know you can very quickly take that expertise and sort of construct um, um, Places to you know, places to live in cases of um, emergency, and I, well, I think quite often it's um, you know if you sort of think about the disciplines of design in a disaster, you know who do you, who do you need? What do you need to do? It's it's quite complicated. You know you need to get infrastructure going again. You need to you know kind of sanitation, water, all those sorts of things, and they kind of need coordination. That's where I think that that design role comes in. Is that you need coordination, but you also also need imagination at that point too. You know, because you know, not that it's a good thing, but there are possibilities for change that might not. You don't just want to rebuild what's been there before necessarily. Yes. You might that might be an opportunity to sort of reimagine the future of them. I think in um, I think in New Zealand they had an earthquake there, didn't they? I thought it was quite interesting what they started doing. You know, how they sort of build temporary churches and you know places of worship and all those sorts of things. I think there's um, I think we're getting better at it, and I think that, you know design professions. It's a bit like uh, in the UK. The, if you study medicine, mm -hmm. it's always been a tradition that that in year four or five you go and work in Africa, or you go you, you go somewhere else, and you do good things. You know, yeah. and I think I think um, you know I think that would be something to learn for design too. You know, is to actually go and experience those things where you. You basically can't just go and be a graphic designer or an architect. You have to do other things, you know, and you have to connect to other people and do good things. Uh, so I think that might be, you know, something that we could maybe think about in terms of education. Uh, I was th thinking that in the, about the, the metaphor thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Are, you, are you always use uh, metaphors to teach my, my, my students? Uh, about the, the, the role of design, uh, the, the metaphor that maybe sometimes we are uh, cookers or we are yep, yep, yep. uh, or uh, but uh, mainly uh, the, the, the metaphor that in design we are making bridges to, to, to put together. Yeah, yeah. 
to referring your, your picture about the, the two entrances. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Philosophy, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, uh, design uh, have to deal with uh, the, the uh, unify uh, or, or yeah, yeah. not not think in, in, in separate things, uh, but but uh, in connecting yeah. and dealing with uncertainty. Yeah, and yeah. That is yeah, very, yeah. very yeah. very precise. Uh, yeah, because. Uh, we, we have to accept the, the uncertainty and yeah. uh, uh, need and connect uh, the logical and the creative. Yeah. And the, yeah. So I think I mean I think that's right. I think I mean that Hilary Cotton is one of those people that mm -hmm. that she sits her expertise in being able to connect connect different connect. things together and actually kind of bring in people and actually have that slightly more an overview of a of some other kind of problem that, that design can certainly help with, but, but won't solve a problem on its own. You need other other kind of things. And I think I think that's, when we did our design thinking course, actually, that was one of the things that we tried to teach our, our students was that it's really important as a designer to know how to get other people to do things. You know, it's not just all about, and I think that the idea of a design genius is we like to kind of, put all this knowledge in one person and say, yeah, they can do this, they just do this, and then bang, no, no, there is there. And they don't need anyone to, else to help them with that. Uh, and I think, um, then I think that's really underestimated. And I, I think I, something about the internet has revealed how collaboration works in, in a much more visible way than it did before, I think. Uh, so that's, that's, I think it's a really important part of design education to try and get that. Mm -hmm. Get that across, or you start thinking about how you can work together in different ways, and there are many different ways of kind of working collaboratively. It's, uh, yeah, so it's fine. I'm full yeah. connected with, with reality. Yeah, yeah, not, yeah. Not, not, not sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hay una otra pregunta. You can always email, email me questions or. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. No, it's good. Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I like it. I mean, it's a nice talk to do.